Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Modern Witch Podcast. I am Devin Hunter, your host, and joining me in the studio today is the amazing Irene Glass. I had the privilege of meeting Irene at the Sacred Space Between the Worlds Conference in Baltimore this year, and I wish I could have spent more time with you because you're kind of fascinating, actually. <laughs> well, I think you're delightful. I was sorry that we got to have, like, a conversation at the end of the conference. <laughs> yeah, as we were collecting and every interview I've heard since with you, I'm like, oh my gosh, we share some values. This is so cool. <laughs> that was my vibe. That was my vibe. I was like, yeah, we, we have we, we have we have commonalities. Um, so we're gonna talk about this, this this really incredible book that I don't think is really a book. I actually think it's a an entire class. Um, it is. It's a manual for a class. That's the way it reads to me as somebody who teaches a lot of classes. So I was hella impressed. Um, and there's some really great stuff there. There's also some really cool stuff that it, commonalities between Black Feather and Black Rose. And so that's awesome. And so I'm very excited to have you here. Um, and to get started, because one of the things that I've been kind of paying attention to with you, and, and as I do my research, sorry for the, the noises, everyone, let me get rid of that. Um, as I've been researching you and following up and kind of stalking you, it's, that's that's what's been going on. Oh, oh been exciting. <laughs> Um, I, I've realized that you have a, a, an, just a different approach to witchcraft, occultism, magic than what we're usually seeing out there than people who I'm, I'm usually talking to. And that's the kind of stuff that I like, I love to wake up though. I think about the first thing in the morning, who are the weirdos out there doing weird stuff. So Irene Glass, what makes your magic different? I know that's a weird question to ask, but there is yeah. something different about you and about your approach. And what, what in your words, do you think that is? So I think it's co-creative relationships. I think that a lot of us do, um, spell driven magic. And I tend to do relationship driven magic where there's like a long-term building of a relationship with spirits in order to accomplish something. And I think that that spills over into my community work. Like I have this weird, magical, practical, emotional, psychological compulsion <laughs> mm -hmm. to connect and to build relationships. And I think that it filters through everything that I do. I have a, a thing around teaching, around community building, and and I think that that takes up so much of the magical brain space that I happen to have. So mm -hmm. I suspect that's what's a, a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, my entire family has a history of like doing good works. And I think that the way that manifested for a witch in the line is like, fine, I'll just use magic to like, to help and make the world a better place. That's what I'm Absolutely. going to do with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and I, like I think that. it's also that thing where we're like, we all really want community or at least those of us who grew up feeling kind of isolated. Like I'm a witch of a certain age, which means I remember the before times when mm -hmm. it was hard to find us. So there's yeah. a strong drive to connect with other people. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's one thing I, I, find myself having conversations with people who who you know maybe been around for seven years or even 10 years and the level of access to each other and information is very different in this modern era than it was when i came in and and when i first started and things like that and so you know one of the things i like to say a lot is it, back in the day it was good enough just to meet another pagan Yes. Like it, it was just good. That was like amazing. You were having coffee together and figuring out, you know, what the stuff was. And it was just this rare gem. And now the, the scene and the culture just evolved into this, this different thing. And no, it's huge. I, I remember. Yeah. So I was stationed in Okinawa, Japan, right? Which means you already have this very limited selection of books that come through the base commissary and PX system. Right. And right. I, I have never had a desire to have physical children of my own. I love to teach, but I'm not a parent type. And mm -hmm. I bought a book on pagan parenting because it had the word pagan in the title. Like, mm -hmm. no shit, I have done that. Because it was that yeah. was the time period, right? This was 1998. Yeah. It was just, it was harder then. It was different. It was different. It was different. Yeah, it yeah. Was different. Absolutely. <laughs> so I think one of the other things that I, that sticks out to me is different. And this is me that I, I share with you is, is this relationship of spirits, this idea that magic and the, the occultism that we practice is heavily steeped in this idea of partnerships, relationships. And I don't know how to explain magic outside of working with spirits. And that's, and I mean, I can, but it, to me, it sounds very boring and it sounds yes. very like it's missing something. And it, it sounds more, sometimes it honestly, it feels like more like play acting, you know, where I'm just like, do you feel the thing that you're trying to do? Like, and, but I'm, I also realize I'm coming at all this from a medium perspective. Like I'm a medium. That's, that was how I right. came that's into That's your natural occultism. state. 
that's my default, right? So I realized that it really does just get down to that's the window pane I get to look through. And so that's the only vantage point that I can really speak from. But that all, but the, even that is really isolating. Just as as a practitioner, really isolating. There are, right. I honestly think it was maybe this year, and it was really after teaching the world sacred space that I actually was able to make contact with people who were out doing their own thing that was similar to mine. But they had found their own path. They weren't coming to me looking for answers. It was me, us having this moment of sharing like, oh, yeah, 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 I get water this way too. And it's like this, it was amazing. But this is really the first time in my life where I've just found people who weren't um, coming to a class or, you know, something like that. It was a very different exchange of a meeting of minds, if you will. And that is- yes it was precious to me. Like I, I came home and I felt rejuvenated and I don't do that after conferences. Usually after conferences, I come home and I sleep for a week, but the, like I left between the world's sacred space rejuvenated. And it was because people like you were there sharing and performing magic and also helping to create such a, an incredible space. So as somebody who has a relationship to spirits, the way that you do, do you feel othered in, in just magical practices when you're communicating mm -hmm. with other people? A little bit. I think that sometimes trying to translate spiritual information into language is challenging anyway. And then we have this this very strong cultural tendency here in the United States to strip the mysticism out of things. There's yeah. a need for practicality. And and I appreciate the science side of witchcraft. I really do. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the the very like, we're going to cook, connect these different things. We're going to do it at this planetary hour and it is going to work and we're going to use sacred geometry and all of that. I, I have a great deal of respect for that. My path within witchcraft is, is much more like, I don't know, I don't want to call it low magic exactly, but it's much more personal, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so a lot of times when I'm talking to people where they have this very structural approach to witchcraft, I'm like, you mean you're not just out in your yard with like a horn of mead having a conversation with a tree? That How do right. you do your thing? Because that's how I do my thing. Like, yeah. Right. <laughs> And yeah. so that sometimes feels a little strange. Um, I'm heathen by path, which also is its own sort of small area within the pagan community as a whole, and one that mm -hmm. has legitimately some fucking problems, like hashtag Nazis suck. So yeah, there are the there are spaces that are that are strange for me. Um, I think some of how I cope with that is by getting involved and in trying to be part of the solution, which is why I sit on so many boards and offer like events that I think is mm -hmm. part of me trying to find my place in a very wide open world that sometimes isn't the greatest fit, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I know. I that. bet you, I was going to say, I'm sure you uh -huh. know this vibe. <laughs> yeah, that vibe. Yeah. And, and and I think for me running into those moments was did, did a lot of like personal damage. Like I just, I, I took things personal and I didn't need to. And it took a long time for me to just realize like, hey, you you really just wanted to do your thing anyway. So just do your thing and people yeah. will show up and it's cool if they do it or whatever. Um, and I get that but because it is, it's hard to find that commonality. It's also, I think there, you know, you talk about um, kind of what the emphasis and the attention is here in America on like relationships to mysticism and things like that. And I also feel like there's there was a, a time period where because of that, people who were writing on topics about like spirits and things like that, they themselves had no inkling towards that actual work as a medium. So yeah. it got transferred and kind of changed into something that really, I, I love just stripping the mysticism out of, it, I think is just a really good way of putting it. But that is something that's that's been hard to chew on. And so yes. writing about things like spirits and developing relationships with spirits is, is, is uncomfortable. Not because it's we not because I think it's weird or I mean I know it's weird, right? And it's not because it's uncomfortable because I feel like I'm doing something I shouldn't be doing, but it's uncomfortable because it's not normal, right? So yes. it's not that what they're gonna see on 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 the shelves. So when you sit down and you're working with Kane to create this outline and and you had to go into it with like motives. Uh, we all do, right? Like we all have yes, a plan for hundred percent we had motives. <laughs> How did you like so obviously spirits, that's a big part of your work. When you went into this and creating this, what part did spirit, let me start with that question. What part did the spirits play in the creation of, of just getting this ball rolling? 
So that book, the the course that became the book, because Black Feather, of course, is it's material that has been taught. Your point that it sounds like a class, yeah, because it fucking mm-hmm. is. It absolutely, you know, that's a school. Yeah. <laughs> Black mm-hmm. Feather Mystery School is in its fourth year now. We're up to Raven level. That's just the first of what will eventually be three, maybe four books. There are some kinds of witchcraft I'm not comfortable teaching in person. Yeah. But the entire thing was the result of uh, an experience and a ritual. Uh, I practice save, which is a Norse divinatory form of like trans possessory um, divination where we talk to a seer who then relays information and the ritual was with the Norns who are I guess we could equate them to the fates which tends to be a little more familiar for most pagans Um, but they have to do with the past the present and the future and the weave of weird throughout our universe and so I asked the Norn that is most commonly associated with the future what I should do to best protect and serve my community and the answer I got was teach make them like you And I spent a year trying to unpack what that meant because I've taught witchcraft for a very long time, but always out of my original tradition or out of material that I had developed but not presented in any coherent way. Like I think most of us can be like, yeah, sure, let's do a tea leaf reading class. I could do that off the top of my, you know. So putting together a, if I was going to make a witch like me, how would I do it? You know, it, it took me 20 years to get where I am. What if there's a better way? What if what if maybe it only takes four, you know? And so I was talking about it with Kane. He's another member of Kindred Crow. He's my spirit brother. I absolutely adore him. And, and he and I sort of were talking about this concept. And what I really wanted to present was spirit work, was relationships with spirits. Uh, and Kane has a, <laughs> I cross-trained into like second wave shamanism very late, um, simply because I'm a fairly advanced witch. So I was able to just jump sort of, jump the stream straight into advanced practice. Kane started there. So together we were able to build a school where we could teach the two skill sets at the same time. And that was the vision. We basically built the school we wish we'd gone to. And the one that in that if in theory, if you do all the classes and you do all your fucking homework, you mm-hmm. should end up with a skill set roughly equivalent to mine in about four years. That's the goal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And that's that is awesome that it's that <laughs> like you're like, nope, this is what we're doing. This is the goal. There is an end game. That's the thing that really because I've I've studied with a bunch of different traditions and I've and I, I was collecting initiations for a while, not intentionally, but I was just trying to find home. Yeah, and, absolutely. We all do that, I think. <laughs> right? Yeah. And I, I got to that point where I realized there there were a lot of mystery traditions where there wasn't an end. There mm. was no, like, there was always going to be the person at, on top pulling some new thing out of their ass. And it it meant this prolonging control over you as an initiate, like, all of this stuff. And I was like, this is actually ego. This isn't what we're, like, yeah. this isn't what I'm here for. Peace out. And so, and, you know, and so that's, so to know that there's something where, yes, there's, there's a. There's there something. is a complete yeah. course of study. And then my goal is that you don't need me anymore. Uh, and the the ultimate goal is I want to release upon the world a wave of badass empowered mm-hmm. spirit working witches because I think we have a role to play in the world to come. I think we're important. I think progressive belief systems are how we get out of the clusterfuck we're in right now. And mm-hmm. I think having more and more people who stand in their power, know how to wield it, know how to relationship build and how to work with people who have differing belief systems. Like one of the big things we teach in Black Feather, it is not an orthodoxy at all. It's a system mm-hmm. wherein you can graft your beliefs. Cain serves the Morrigan. I'm heathen. We're very different in that way, mm-hmm. but the system works for both of us. So the goal is just like, here, here's a sword, here's a shield, go be a badass. We need to change the world. And that's like, that's the ultimate goal of Black Feather. Yeah. I'm just trying to make really good witches. <laughs> I like that. I, 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 the, the thing we say in Sacred Fires is like that the goal is to fill the world with witch kings and witch queens and witch exes and and to just fill every like fill the world with as much magic as we possibly can in this lifetime yes. not for our sake but for the world's sake right like and, and yes that's going to look a million different ways for all of us and it should because it's not about it's not about the banner it's about the shield it's it's not about the banner it's about the tools right and yes. that is something that i really respect when teachers put that first right like it's it's hard to i i know as a writer i've been in that situation of well how do i explain witchcraft to people without putting in my my own things right so i have to you know if i talk about the witch king and the witch queen or whatever or the star goddess which is this great wonderful androgynous force and 
try to talk about the magic related to those things, it's difficult to do that without making it sound religious, right? Like right, without, and right. I don't mean to, it's just really hard to talk about this thing without giving it some face that people can approach and understand and appreciate. And yes. so it's a tricky thing to teach witchcraft that way, the way that you guys are doing it. And I, I ask you, you know, after four years of doing this, has the model shifted from the original intention with it? I mean, it how had that to, grow? yeah. Mm -hmm. So the the way the system is laid out is it's basically a year per level, and we had the plague happen right in the middle of it, right? So black feather magpie training, we began that in 2019, and then for rook, which is the second level, we had to switch to zoom. You know, and so we did Rook and um, Crow via Zoom, which was never the original plan. In a way, it worked out well because we were able to bring witches in that really wanted to take the training but were geographically too distant before. But it also meant that what we had planned had to shift and change. So Magpie training will probably stay consistent, but in person versions of Rook and Crow level in the future will include a lot more hands on spirit work. Instead, we're kind of making that up now in Raven level where there's a heavy emphasis on the spirit work because we we were unable to teach that in person mm -hmm. uh so it has changed and of course it's been four fucking years i've learned some different things so i've got two yeah. magpie trainings starting up soon there'll be material that's not in the books because i still you know part yeah. of why i love working at festivals and conferences is because i get to go to all the classes for free so yeah. Yeah. like <laughs> yeah. i uh, i attended sacred space for like a decade before i joined the board like i love learning from other people so and, and our own practices change, you know, our yeah. own paths influence things. There's if we're doing I it right know now that I didn't. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. If it's not growth, it's entropy. And we only want one of those things. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, 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 yes. I, I love the, um, I think the thing that, that is a trap is the stagnancy. And, yes. and when you don't have a big organized religion and you don't have a big book that tells you what the, like to, that you can revisit the same thing over and over and over again in a different way. Like we don't have those things that I think um, let people go on autopilot. And so right. we get stagnant because we can't just slip, whip, you know, slip into that. Life happens. We get distracted. Yada, yada. It's really hard to be. And it, and I'm saying this as somebody who, you know, I, I'm 36 years old. I can say I've been practicing witchcraft. Like I initiated myself when I was 13 years old in a field and I had been practicing oh since I was God. 10. But if we want to say, you know, seriousness, okay, so 18, getting real and whatever. But so I've been around for a minute, right? Over 20 years. And I can say that in all this time, I have gone through plenty of plateaus where I don't yes. feel it. I'm not wanting to leave me alone. I want to go read a book that isn't about this stuff, you know, like, please, you know, things like, like we all go through those moments, but getting back on the horse is really difficult. And one of the things that I, I particularly, I tried to do with my witch power series that I see here present very much so. in in this book is that it's approaching magic and magical training and magical life from two angles. You've got this, Hey, if you're a beginner, this is what you can do to like save a lot of time and a bunch of bullshit. But if you are an experienced person and you're feeling a drag or you're feeling stagnancy in your craft, you can pick this book up and it's written for you. Like you, yes. you, you did this great job at writing for both of those voices and both of those thank audiences. You. And no, thank you. Because this is like, I was able to look at it. I've been, I'm 36 years old. I've been practicing for over 20 years, teaching witchcraft for a long ass time. I got stuff out of this. Like that's why I said, this that was a class. so good like, to hear. Yeah, no, there's, it's beautiful. So I, I love talking about books like this. I love talking about projects like this with, with witches because my audience, people who are listening, that's what they want. Like I get text messages or I get emails from people saying, what's new out there? Like who's, who's yeah. doing stuff out there? And yes, this what's is, cool this, and interesting. Yeah, yeah. Legit. And, and it's just, there's, you know, like we, we have our, our stuff going on and, but it's, you know, it's time for an update and we know that. And so we're, we've been working on that update. Um, but it's been years of of kind of grinding away and developing this this stuff on you know that that we're doing and i'm looking out and i see a handful of groups that are doing again their own thing it's similar and it's exciting and the reason why it's exciting is because to me that validates the work that i'm doing <laughs> right the fact that people are doing very similar things we have not talked we have yes. our own <laughs> things and we're coming to the same conclusions that means something like we talk about scientific 
you know, process, being able to get similar results from different experiments uh, from, you know, different parts of the world, that's big, that, that leads yes. to evidence, right? So to me, that's really exciting. And when I read this, I, I not only felt that kindredness, but I, I felt, again, there's this, this push for advancement. We're not, yeah. we're not saying let's coddle the stagnancy. We're saying, Hey, let's, let's light that fire. And that's a yeah. really exciting thing. So let me ask you this. Why Black Feather? Why the name Black Feather? Why Magpie? Can we talk? Because usually you think of Magpie and we're thinking of picking pieces here and there mm -hmm. and what we want and things like that. Um, so I'm curious, how did how did how did the the, the, the Corvids get involved? Yeah, it's just because Corvid family, right? I, I wanted four birds and I liked the beginning. The first year of witchcraft for me was as, as a raw beginner when I was like 15 years old was, oh God, it's shiny and this is shiny and this is shiny, I got to shove it all in my pockets. And it was such an exciting <laughs> movement into witchcraft. And I think that uh, your first your first couple of years are like that where you want to learn everything because you haven't figured out where your, your really good skills are yet. But the big thing is because I have a thing for Corvids, the pagan folk band I'm in is called Kindred Crow. <laughs> like <laughs> uh, there is a crow presence in the world and it, it is very present with me. Uh, uh, the main reason for that, and I'm going to get super serious for a moment here, uh, I escaped an abusive marriage uh, back in 2014. And as I was leaving that, the last few months when I was preparing my escape, there were crows everywhere, everywhere. And it was this constant presence. And one of the interesting things that my brain did, um, we all recover from abuse in different ways and we uh, we heal in different ways for several years and i still wrestle with it i lost my ability to wear color without having some sort of a panic attack so i wear almost all black all the time um i am you know one of the big things that i'm working right now is actually getting back to a place where i can wear color i'm up to like grays and kind of some soft greens um if i am doing something intentionally with magic obviously that's a different situation but just in terms of daily wear so the spirits of crow like that that egregore that over spirit is just a huge part of my personal path so it seemed appropriate to call the magical school something related to the corvid family with I like which that. i feel such a, a resonance yeah I, I think you have a lot of corvid people out there going yes right now so, <laughs> like there's yeah. a thing those of us who are like crow and raven people it's there's true. most of us is like we've been through some shit and that's why we've chosen yeah. this one it's true <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had so it's because I, I had a uh, I worked with a priestess of the Morgu for a really long time, and she's really big on crows and ravens and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I and I and I'm like an I'm an owl guy. I've all, I know that's like oh, that's so awesome. cliche, but I'm an owl person. And they're so owl, great though. Owls are the shit, and owls come to me like it's like owls come hang out with me. It's awesome. I it's it, one of those def like yes, I'm a magical person because I talk to owls. Like it's a thing. Like I, but I love it, but. You know, I, I I kind of rejected the corvidness because it was so cliche in my head. I'm like, right. Oh, just like I just like I I didn't work with Hakate for a long time because it was like the most cliche for a little gay boy witch to work with Hakate. So I was like, yeah, I won't do that. Um, but so I moved out to California. Crows, are, crows and ravens here, are very smart, disturbingly mm -hmm. intelligent birds. Uh, but they they don't necessarily hang out around the house. What does hang around the house are blue jays. And oh, I love yes. blue jays. And they're they're kind of assholes, but they're amazing. They're assholes. They they destroy things in my yard. However, it's obviously that's the corvid that like wants to talk to me because it's the one yeah. that won't shut up, you know. So I'll go outside and I'll sit in my garden and I'll I'll talk to the the blue jays and things like that. But it's it it's um definitely just one of those things where the corvids the corvids like the magical folk. Like period, I've noticed, and those of us yeah. who've had a, a rough patch and and honestly <laughs> evolved magic through that process, yes, tend to yes. have a lot of Corvid energy. It's that's an interesting. No, an interesting I, I think it's accurate. Well, and I think that we see it in in almost all the world mythologies, where if it is a region where there is a strong Corvid presence, crows and ravens have a lot of a lot of magic tied to them within yeah. native stories, right? Like coming from Absolutely. heathenry, we got ravens out the nose Everywhere. in our yeah. mythology and specifically there with Oven, who if we want to look at like a crazy dude who goes out into the wilds to find more magic, that's right. him. That, that's so, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, you yeah. love owls. Have you seen the new Tarot of the Owls deck? Llewellyn sent yes. me one to play test. It's the cutest thing. I wish I'd had it when I was like 15. It is the yeah. most adorable deck in the whole world. Yeah. Like I've yeah. been like, no, y'all, this one's so good. It's so fucking good. It's, it's yeah. so no, cute. It's super cool. I'm, I'm, I'm rather excited about it, actually. Yeah. Matt That's Matt, adorable. and I share an owl connection. And so he uh, he gets all the owl things. And then we have, we have owl time together. Um, I love that. So I want to get a little serious for a second, um, sure. because one of the things that I am dedicated to doing this year with the show is to talk to people who did go through hard shit and talk to them about the magic that was forged during those those times. Because yeah. in Sacred Fires, um, one of the things that I, 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 I tell everybody when we first start the training is that like this magic came from a lot of really terrible shit that happened in my life like a lot of terrible things that I wish upon no one. And it was a lot of pain and a lot of suffering. And I am not saying that to be dramatic. I'm saying that because that was what I had to go through to stumble on this. And yes. I don't want you to ever have to stumble on it that way. And yes. it's because like, I wouldn't wish this, I wouldn't wish it on my enemies, you know? So it, because of that though, it's, it, you know, it is really, it's a really personal magic. It's a very, really personal style and it's heavily involved in, in spirits and having that connection. And it really, it gets down to when I was going through some of the hardest stuff, sexually assaulted. Um, and the, that, the, when I was 19 and that happened, that was a really hard thing and, and very difficult thing. Um, and that was when spirits really started to like, talk to me about magic and right. before it was like i always had friends and i always had like spirits in my in my energy field and in my area and i could talk to them and we did magic together but it was really when i hit that rock bottom and i felt powerless that the spirits really came through and was like you don't have to feel this way yes. do you know that you can not be this guy do you know that you can still be that person that you want to become and, and, you know, and it was this incredible thing. And it was from all that stuff, right, that that my magic was forged. And I like to think of myself as a pretty damn decent magician. So I, I feel like when we go through those things, we make contact with something. And yes. I want to know, what did you make contact with when you were going through that dark shit? What came yeah. and and what was that moment where your fingers touched and the spark happened? Can, can we talk yeah, about that? Yeah, absolutely. So for me, it was to some of the, <laughs> it's funny the way we talk about the way we encounter gods, right? Because some of us court relationships and then some of us basically get kidnapped. Um, and for me, that was when Freya came for me, essentially, it was when my fucked up marriage was winding down and I was realizing that I didn't know who I was. I was so young, Devin. I I fell in love with my abuser when I was 19. I was married by 22 and I was with him for 14 years. I mean, it was, and I was just a kid. So when you have someone whose modus operandi is uh, psychological abuse and gaslighting, it really does a lot to your sense of who you are. I'm naturally kind of a people pleaser. So I became what he wanted me to be. And so when that all finally began to crumble, I had this amazing goddess of magic and sovereignty uh, basically come to me in the center of a labyrinth. Labyrinth work is a huge part of my practice and plant a sword in the center of my chest and basically tell me to get up, you know? And, and that was, it's always hard to talk about a transcendental experience, but I, felt this power flowing through me and it's like no i i may not know who i am right now but i will and the other big thread that is present in that magpie training book i don't know if you got to the elemental life sculpting chapter but i basically had from the outward appearance the american dream i had the house and then you know the nice big house and the cars paid off and the heavy metal band and the the looks and all of it and it was hell and so I completely blew my life up when I left. Like I destroyed all of it. I lost a lot of friends. I, um, I absolutely dropped a nuke on that life. And elemental life sculpting was how I rebuilt my life according to my value system. It was how I found myself again, my, my inner north, right? That was the mm. finding my own sense of identity and being like, no, this is, this is me. This is what feels right. And so one of the big things that came out of that is if you need to blow up your life or if it happens to you, because fucking shit happens, you yeah. know, yeah. people suddenly have the rug pulled out from under them. There's a map. 
in magpie training that you can mm-hmm. use to develop your it, your it's literally a map it's it literally, literally the map. oh like, shit stuff just happened what do i yes. do <laughs> sit down like, step here. one like it's yes. right there it's yeah no exactly. it's brilliant like and and that's that's my sort of the, some of the bloody fruit that came out of that particular situation mm-hmm. is like i know how to do this now like i know how to blow up a life and reset it so that it actually matches yeah. and that was some of the deep magic that came from it and on top of that like just my relationship with the spirits became so much more profound we forget that when we're with an abuser we use so much energy trying to keep the next explosion from happening that we become half the witch that we have the capacity to be so what was crazy was also like hitting magical puberty at like 32 34 Mm -hmm. you know and be like oh shit (laughs) okay i am four times more psychic than i was and there are so many more spirits around me and Mm -hmm. wow that spell worked way better than i expected and it was because i'd been half a human for 14 fucking years you know Absolutely. Yes. Yes. I remember I was with a guy who had like super religious parents. And by the time he was an adult, he just had hatred for anything that was spiritual. And he got with me, which was hello. And I was meditating one day and he came home and he was so dismissive of all of it that I couldn't talk about anything without it being a whole shit storm. And he came home one day and I was meditating. I was just doing my, my practice and he actually stepped over me i was sitting on the floor and he stepped over me and i had this and i just got up and i was like what the fuck and you know and that was it (laughs) yeah but but it was this moment of like no like you like that was this deliberate belittling of of my thing that i i've gone out of my way not to force upon you or make you feel included in and and it's hard when you're with people who don't respect you, who don't respect your inclinations, your insights. I mean, it's hard. Like just as a medium, it's hard to date. Period, because people think you're nuts, um, and and that's okay. You know, I've learned to. I don't have to worry about it now. But you know, it was a thing. <laughs> um, and so you know, it's it's just it's so difficult to talk about sensitive stuff and to talk about this. You know, the the spirits involved and all of that. And it, and I, I just want to say thank you for talking about it and and you sure. talk about it every it's not like you're this is your super secret and you're revealing it no here. you are no you were like hell no <laughs> like if this no. is you too let's get up well, and, yeah. well yeah. especially because like i think that there's a there's a thing that we have that we still put forth in our culture where like abuse is something that happens to weak or quiet people and i just like to for everyone playing along at home i was a fucking marine when i met this guy mm-hmm. right i'm a monster in a lot of ways mm-hmm. i am big and strong i have always yes. been i have a lot of bravado that carries you are the through. nicest person i never want to piss off <laughs> it's a good choice you know yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but it's true but sometimes that puts a target on your back, right? Mm-hmm. Abusers tend to look for people that they want to break. And one of the big things that I want to get across to people is this happened. This happens. It happens more frequently. And if it happened to you, it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. Mm-hmm. No one is wrong for trusting someone who says that they love them. We're supposed to be able to trust the people that love us. Yes. And if that happened to you, if you got betrayed, girl, come sit next to me. Like, we got mm-hmm. shit to talk about. Have some whiskey. We will get you unfucked. Like, there is mm-hmm. a way out, you know? Yes. Yes. And so I'm very, very uh, verbal about it, especially I think for me, it took a long time. I, I mean, I was a year out of that relationship before I finally with my therapist was like, no, that, oh my God, that was abuse because I never got hit. Right. Like in, mm-hmm. I think there was another thing, like I'm a child of the eighties. So we didn't have a lot of the language around the different styles and kinds of abuse. Right. And, and so he never actually laid a hand on me, but he broke my brain, you know, yeah, like big time. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. So let me ask you this. So somebody is listening right now and they're not feeling great about their situation in life. They're whether it's they are experiencing some sort of abuse from a partner or they maybe are on the other side of it and just feeling lost and kind of hopeless or yeah. maybe they're just in a position right now where they're feeling like life has been beating them down and they are they they need something to give. Where are we going to start? We're going to start honestly with journaling. So if they're in an abusive situation, we're going to start with opening another bank account and starting to channel money into that. And we're going to start by talking to our friends and figuring out whose couch we can surf on. Like we're going to start by planning the the get the fuck out plan. Like that's, that is first. But if you're on the other side of it, we're going to start by sitting down and taking time and actually figuring out who the fuck we are and what we want. 
I, I do spiritual counseling kind of for a living. I do a lot of tarot readings. This is, this is the world that I live in. You would be amazed how many people don't actually know who they are or what they want. Yeah. And until we know that, we're just going to keep running in circles and keep ending up in the same shitty relationships and the shitty situations. And so basically we're going to sit down, we're going to go through it elementally and go, what actually feels like home for you? What does that look mm -hmm. like? What does it feel like? Who's present? You know, how do you want to experience love? What kind of work do you want to do? Not in terms of the actual, like, I'm an accountant, but are you an extrovert? Are you an introvert? Do you need to be helping people? Do you prefer to be on your own? Where are your values? We're going to figure out who your core self is. And we're going to build the map based on that. And then for every section, we're going to figure out one or two small steps. And then we're going to start with one. It only takes one to just start moving in the right direction. Humans are amazing in terms of our malleability, in terms of our neuroplasticity. We have this incredible capacity just as the style of being we are. And then if you add magic to that, Jesus fucking Christ, there's so much good shit that can happen. All we need to do is figure out where we're going. You know, we need to have a visualization for the end of the spell, essentially. <laughs> yeah. So that's where we land, right? So we build the plan. Absolutely. And Absolutely. then we begin to implement it straight up witchcraft just on a large lifestyle level. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Got to take a breath. You got to find your center. You got to write some shit down because it's all in your head. And your head is a very big place and it's very messy up there. And yes. then we start making those practical steps. Yeah. Those things well, forward. and if you've spent a while like with an abuser, you might not even have a good a good set. Like there are, it's yeah. funny when I when I teach this stuff in person, I'm like, open a Pinterest board. Like if you don't know what you like that's okay. Yeah. Just start saving images that you're like, oh, that's pretty. And you'll find out what you actually like, what does feel like home, what feels safe, you know, what, how you want your body to feel, what is appealing. There's, there's an answer to all of that. It's just, we haven't actually sat and thought about it most of the time. So realistically, and I don't want to, and it's, this might sound like a cheesy kind of question, but realistically speaking, how much is personal acceptance, personal accountability, um, just being able to take responsibility for your part in anything before like how big of a deal is that or can we just drop shit and run like what's like we what's can drop important shit, like, in those moments <laughs> what's yeah. most important is you survive absolutely okay good. i am yeah, a big yeah. fan of like get out at all costs think we about can it later do yeah. that work later right yeah. now i do think that taking responsibility for ourselves is really important you are not it is not your fault what happened to you is not your fucking fault and also those of us who have damage need to take responsibility for it so mm -hmm. i see a therapist i take psych meds i'm very open about all of that it mm -hmm. helps me function and and be a better part of me i also do my shadow work you know like we have not just our psychological trauma but we have a whole lot of witchcraft stuff we got to do we got to deal with our ancestral bullshit as well like there mm -hmm. is so much unpacking to do and taking responsibility also gives you power we can't really wield our power effectively unless we are whole uh, like one of my favorite things to tell people is like becoming light is not as important as becoming whole, right? Mm -hmm. We have this thing with like, I'm going to become, you know, princess positive and only rainbows will shoot out of my ass and da 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 da. I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> what I want you to be is authentic in your life because that's where the power comes from. Knowing mm -hmm. who you are, including all of your shadows. I am capable of a towering rage and I know where to direct it and how to access it and how to put it back in the yeah. box when I'm done. Mm -hmm. Like, know thyself yeah, <laughs> so absolutely. yes the the responsibility and the accountability very important also just fucking survive at first the rest of that we can do that in the year plus yeah, recovery right. like that's later Seriously. get out get out yeah. of the situation first <laughs> yeah yeah there's this there's this thing that we have when we're when we are on the 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 victim side of things whether we're fully aware of that or not where we we are we come up with excuses to keep us stuck and to keep yes. us in that place but we're trying to be responsible because we made a commitment to screw that fuck that it is commitments whatever I, I these are the things that i know kept me in bad situations because i was like well you know this person's gonna say i you know i don't have honor or i don't have any integrity or i am a am a liar and you know and none of that is the reality of the situation the reality of the situation is this is toxic and yes. this is not working for me i am sick here and I'm sick spiritually, mentally, spiritually, physically, whatever. Like you're, there's sickness here and I have to fix that. And I, I'm not well. And that's a really important thing to embrace first. 
right? I don't yes. feel well in this situation and I need to move forward. And that we have is so, so much. Yeah, no, I was thinking of it as the supposed tos, right? Like mm -hmm. there's so much supposed to. And it, and many times the people in our lives that are keeping us in boxes are they're reinforcing that narrative. Like one of my abusers favorite things to say to me was that I was never going to be able to make a living ever. Like I was never mm -hmm. going to be financially independent or anything like that. Yeah. And and that's a thing that, you know, golden chains are real. That's a thing that will mm -hmm. keep somebody in a relationship, particularly fembodied people that tend to be very vulnerable to that. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So it's, you know, that breaking of the chains, basically you're going to have to get to a point where you want to live and it mm -hmm. doesn't matter what it costs. Like that was basically where I got, where I was like, I don't fucking care if I lose everybody, I am leaving. Mm -hmm. And here's the beautiful thing, even with an abuser like mine where no one saw it coming, you know, somebody who mm -hmm. had a good sort of reputation and standing in the community. It is shocking how many people don't go and the new people that come in, right? Mm -hmm. I, and my life is now peopled with friends that I can't imagine living without Devin. They're yeah. everything I love in this world, yeah. you know? And, yeah. and when I left nine years ago, I didn't know any of them. Mm -hmm. And there is another side. Like, I swear, if yeah. anyone is listening to this and is in that place, it is worth it. Like, it is yeah. worth it. There is, the other side is worth it. Getting there sucks. The other side is worth it. It super sucks. It's so like the sucks. 10 of wands. Like, it's yeah. just that fucking oh, yeah. drag. Like, you gotta do it. You <laughs> got what's terrible. Like, 10 swords to kill. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I will say finding your, your tribe, your family, however you want to word that, but finding your, your real people, even yeah. if it's just two or three other people or even one other, but really finding that outside of your romantic partner is an incredibly important thing to go through, I feel. And yes. and, and it's hard to talk about that with people because it's not like, I'm not saying shut your partners out of what you do, but I'm saying you no, have to have, have an more. identity outside of that yes. because then that helps the total identity of, of you as a, 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 par a partnership, whatever. So but it's so hard to do that and it's so hard to feel stable and that you can create your own stability, right? That, that golden chain. Um, so in this instance, real quick, so let's just, let's talk some, some, some witchery here. And for this case, so let's say we are, we are stuck on a golden chain, yeah. right? And which I know is so many people have that story and, and especially fem body people, people who are, who find themselves with parents, you know, things like there's a lot on the line, the people's lives, right? Not just yours. So we're in this place. We have hit the oh shit time, right? We got to go to magic. So yes, we're going to journal and yes, we're going to take care of the stuff, but from a, a practical, I need to get that cauldron out kind of perspective. What are we going to do? Like what, where do we want to start there? Yeah, like so in, in the late stage failed capitalist hellscape that we live in, we open the money road first. Yeah. Just yeah. flat out, just fucking the, your prosperity magic, the 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 one that works for your, whether that is a um one of those copper cauldron situations, whether that mm -hmm. is working with the spirits of abundance, whether that's sacrifices to New Earth, whatever that looks like, we open the money road first and we figure mm -hmm. out a way to build a cushion. Mm -hmm. Um then on top of that, we do spells for helpful people to come into our lives because you're going to need an army. I mm -hmm. did. You know, you're gonna need friends that can let you crash on their couch. You're going to need people to help you manage. If you're going to do like a divorce like I did, you're going to need a good lawyer. So we begin to do magic for bringing the right people in. And then on top of that, we do healing spells for ourselves. Mm -hmm. We begin that mm. work of trying mm. to, to build up what has been broken. So yes. start there. Those yes. three. Money, people, heal thyself. Yes, 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 yes. Because that will actually lead to success. Like that yes. will lead to success. That is a plan to success out of that situation. Um, and I, I, you, we have to heal. We have to heal. I know there was this whole thing going around the the witchy world last year about how magic wasn't self care, and and I was like, okay, but effective magic includes self care, and you have right. to. It just bottom line, like you can say what you want to say, but we've all been around for a minute and we can look back and there's plenty of evidence of wh what works and what doesn't. I don't know any really good witches that don't have some form of magical self-care, whether that's mm -hmm. a regular affirmation cycle, whether that's a regular purification practice, and then sort of like energy healing, like everybody's got their thing that keeps them going. It's, as you say, it is not the complete picture, and I don't love the like, witchcraft's just intention. It's fucking not. It's actually magic. And you can use magic to do some good shit to yourself, mm -hmm. for yourself. Where I mean, I will hit my altar so fast to heal a friend. And mm -hmm. a lot of people, they just it never occurs to them to turn that inward, you know, and, yeah. and you have to when you're in a real fucked up place. You've got to. Yeah. 
Yeah, we we have a tendency as witches, period, to to help everyone fix their problems. We do not fix our own. And yeah. and so my my rule with my students when we when we really get into like spell spell casting and things like that is like, hey, for at least a year, every time you cast a spell for somebody else, you have to cast a spell for yourself. Oh, and, I love and that way that. you get used to that that energy exchange. And you know, yeah. it's just like just like when uh, being raised, you know, evangelical, everything was God's was, oh, that's because of God. That's because of God. I'm on the phone with my mom today and and we're going over stuff and she's, oh, thank God. I said, or you could thank me because I'm the one that did the, you know, the 14 hours <laughs> right. of paperwork. But, but it's that thing where we, we give credit away to yes. some mysterious force or something. You're the one that's turning that fire. You're the one cutting the wood. You're the one bringing it. Yeah. You take pride in the fact that you even want to be in a place in your life where you're you're going to take you seriously and you want to get out of a situation and, and let that feed you. Because it's hard. Yes. You, you're going to feel lonely. You're going to feel stuck. And you're going to feel like you don't have the support. Because we don't yeah. always get to have the, the the finding our tribe first, right? No, and and like the first year for me was lonely, right? And I especially because I wasn't sure who I could still talk to, you mm -hmm. know. But like mm -hmm. you know, the the black feather system, the very first altar we build is to you. Like that entire first year, we don't add jack shit to that altar that doesn't relate yep. to you and your practice and your self blessing and your fucking shielding, like. It is that is literally what we do. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That's yes. literally what we do. Yep. No, See, you have I to love alter that. to yourself. And this is what, <laughs> this is what I love about like witchcraft and the way we all get similar yes. messages at the same time. That's what time. I'm saying. It like, it okay, this is the unfucking. We are doing yes. the unfucking yes. and we are going it to unfuck all the witches. <laughs> yes. It's it's beautiful. It really like I said, it for me it it's it's this oh i am not alone in what i think is important in these things and i yeah. you know I, I i was just posting today on facebook about how for a lot for several years i haven't really felt pagan mm -hmm. and it was really that i i feel like just the neo pagan uh, contemporary like just kind of the umbrella of beliefs i don't always just feel like i fit into like i do worship nature but for me nature is this like really big cosmic thing it isn't like a rock and a tree and, and, right. and as much as I, I love mythology and what ancient peoples were doing, very little of that do I feel applies to my modern life. So I, I, and I don't, I don't personally enjoy developing and recreating ancient rituals and things like that's not my bag sure. of, of tea. Um, I, I, I feel like if, if the, if this was, this stuff was going on now, we would use glue sticks and LED lights and we would be doing all the crazy shit that, you know, we, we don't have to change anyway. So I, I just haven't really felt the jive, right. For, for yeah. a couple of years. And, and as an author, that's been difficult because a lot of people I write for are pagan. And so when I try to share that, they take it personal. I'm like, no, no, no. This is me saying like, I don't feel like a tree hugger and I don't know why. Cause I always did. And now I don't. And that's a weird thing, but I want to be honest about that because that is, this is the process, right? And today I saw this horrible post from somebody who went to a PPP uh, over the weekend. who was a, a Christian and was doing like covert. Was that the, yes, I yeah. saw that shit. And you know what? I got pissed. I, I saw it yesterday and it pissed me off and I put my phone down. I said something like on the comment, I put my phone down and I walked away and I saw it again this morning. And I thought I would not be this personally upset. If, if I didn't feel attacked by this. So I am pagan. Like it, this is the proof right here that I feel yeah. attacked. And therefore this defines this thing in this really very real way for me. And it was this really beautiful moment. Um, all of this to say, finding identity, finding your place within your tribe, finding that those people who can reflect your values back. That's so important. We can't always find that. And, and online, it's really hard. It's, it's yes. really hard to find that online. What are some things that we can do when we are in that solo mode, when we are rogues going from, you know, one place to the next, how do we find comfort? How do we find resiliency? How do we find endurance and make those connections? Like what's the, like uh, genuinely, right? Cause there's a lot of bullshit self-help stuff out there, but like the reality right. is what do we do? This, so there are, I, my answer to that is twofold. The first one is, the stories that we tell ourselves are so important. And I'm a big one for repeat media usage for certain end goals. So when you're feeling isolated and alone, you reread and rewatch the material that reminds you that you're a magical beast and that 
there is great beauty and power in this world and you watch and read the things that make you feel strong you know even if that's like fucking Dragonlance Chronicles from when you were 15 years old whatever it is that helped you realize you were magical in the first place we we go back to those stories and we seek out new stories that do the same thing, right? Like I feel like the Barbie movie is like this kind of funny moment of massive empowerment for femme bodied and femme presenting people. And it's one of those stories of power and sovereignty. So we tell ourselves those stories. Mm -hmm. And then the other way we do it, at least for me, is that we think about where our commonalities are and go to those places. So I run a CUPS chapter. We're one of the largest in the country. Seek thy local Unitarian Universalist mm -hmm. congregation. Yeah, no, seriously. Like, yeah. Those folks share your values. They mm -hmm. do. They will welcome a pagan with open arms. You won't be alone anymore. You can mm -hmm. get onto their social and environmental justice team. Find some people. And if you don't have one of those, like, fuck, go to the local museum. Go to your local botanical garden. Witches and pagans are a little predictable right like if you've got That's a true. renaissance festival you're gonna find us gonna if find you've got some. a yeah. exactly if you've got a science fiction yep. convention happening you're gonna find some there you're gonna find yep. some working at the local greenhouse like that's where we are go find yeah. people yeah. you know and that's what I, I tell people is that you'd be surprised how many fellow witches and occultists are out there because there's way more than we think and it's because most of us just don't talk about it um, yep. And they're not going to spread it out on Facebook and stuff like that to the world. But you, but but chances are, if you're really interested in something else that's not magical, and and you you find a weird magical inspiration from it, other people do too. And yes. so, like, I, science fiction conventions are the one place. I'm glad you mentioned that because I'm like, no, seriously, like I've met some damn cool occultists at, at science fiction conventions uh, that I still talk to today. You know, yeah. So it's this. It's it's totally true. You can look outside of of witchcraft for witches and and for people who at least are in alignment with your 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 thoughts and and yeah, you know, all of those exactly. Things. Basically, fine. You know, I, I think it's we we draw strength from our from our people, from the closest ones around us, from our communities. Um, there's a a wonderful book that talks about the fact that hope is one of the most vulnerable and fragile of the human emotions. And it's also mm -hmm. one that tends to crumble when it meets entrenched opposition. And part of what community does is it replenishes hope by allowing us to be around other people like us Love and work that. towards shared goals. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's a, uh, it's the book is called a house for hope. It's required reading. If you're a commission lay minister within the Unitarian Universalist world, which I am. And also it's a really just a damn good book for anyone who's working in modern theology, but it reminds us of why we need community, why we need people. And it's so that you're, your hope, your engine of transformation stays stays lit. If we can't imagine something other than what we have, mm -hmm. we're never going to get there. We're never going to get there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. No, someone I just mean, popped into the chat into the chat to say I found some of my tribe at the gym. Hell yes, absolutely. Boom. Like I worked at a yoga studio for years. Yogis, half pagan, easily, maybe more. And the ones yeah. that aren't are like, I really love the moon. Like, right, <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, at the very least, we're all moon blinked. That's what I say. Like, right, it, exactly. we're all, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So, I, so real quick, because I do want to make sure everybody sees Magpie Training, Black Feather Mystery School, book one is available now, and you can order it online. That's you right. can order it directly from Irene's website. Um, and you can pretty much get it. I mean, just ask for it at your local bookstore. They'll order it in because they can do that. Um, exactly. So, anywhere. definitely check this out. But before I let you go, I want to ask you a question because you, at the uh, beginning of the interview, you talked about the labyrinth. Yeah. And I thought this chapter in the book was really beautiful. And one of the things that I've always gotten out of labyrinths is it's this representation of the golden road. I mean, in so many ways, right? You're following in a very meditative way. You're doing path working, right? So yes, in the book, there was, it's approached so beautifully. And, and I feel like a lot of witches do, like don't do labyrinth work. And it's kind of like, Hey folks, there's this really cool, like actually ancient thing that you could do right now. That's pretty, you know, that would kind of change your life. So can we talk about why labyrinths play the role they do in the training, but also in your personal work? Yeah, absolutely. So for personal work, I was in a real bad tailspin uh, in, I think it was 2008. Um, I was not feeling spiritually connected. And that's the thing that's usually constant for me. I couldn't find my my thread at all. And I went to um, a retreat called Twilight Covening that's held every year up in Massachusetts. And I joined a labyrinth clan and the description of the clan is like, we will get you unstuck. <laughs> Devin, they fucking got me unstuck. <laughs> like labyrinths take you into yourself and then back out again. They are 
an allegory for everything that happens. And they are a form of deep work and meditation when you approach them as the magical tool that they are. I mean, we think about the idea of a true sigil. A labyrinth is a true sigil. You can, I've spray painted one on the ground in a park and people have had massively transcendental experiences. That sigil works regardless of the creator of it. They're one of the oldest symbols we have. Most cultures have evolved some version of them. You know, there are labyrinths in the ground in Sweden that are, you know, 3000 years old. So old, we don't even really understand what they were for. But we know now that if you walk one intentionally, if you take a problem in, you come out the other side with something that's more like a solution. And they're a great way to take things off. So if you're carrying a whole bunch of bullshit and heaviness and shadow and you feel disconnected, walk into a labyrinth and start examining those pieces. And so the reason it's so present in Black Feather is because it's so present in my personal practice. Like, I'll just like right here, see labyrinth tattoo. Like, <laughs> so basically, I think they're vital. I've used mine to develop more compassion. I've used mine as a prayer form to talk to my gods. I've used it to solve problems. I've used it just to lower my blood pressure if I'm having a fucking day. And the cool thing is there are labyrinths all over the place and you can do like printable ones um, so that you can just use a, a finger labyrinth, something that you draw. I like the walkable ones a little bit better. If you hop onto worldwidelabyrinthlocator.com, you will find you know, you can search by zip code, you'll find all the labyrinths near you. Go give it a try. It, it's a, a wonderful tool for self-work. Most of the things we wrestle with have layers to them. And every time we go around that center point, every time we change direction, it's a way to look at that problem in a, a new form. Um, and just the, the true sigil nature of it, they really are magic just straight up labyrinths are magic. When you walk onto one, you never really completely know what's going to happen. And that's one of the things I love the most about them. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. All right. So if we want to find out more about you, where are we going to send people? Sure thing. So I blog weekly at glasswitchcottage.com. That is a great way to find me. Uh, and I've been writing there for, I think since 28, a long time now there's a lot up there there's a search mm -hmm. function i write about magic constantly if you've got a problem chances are there's an article where it might be useful uh if you are interested in black feather that is blackfeathermystery.com there are two magpie trainings coming up one is in person in frederick maryland that starts in september so if you're geographically close you can do that there is a a zoom version basically a, a global or international or universe version coming up that starts in early november uh and that's a great way to get in touch as well um and if you want to hear the music that's kindredcrow.com there you go yeah i know david salisbury said uh he's like oh irene teaches over zoom it would be a shame if a bunch of people bought tickets and then went and raised <laughs> hell and like, it would be a shame wouldn't it <laughs> Uh, that, yeah. would that would be awful. Well, horrible. and that's the other thing, like through Glasswitch, I do monthly workshops um, and mm -hmm. I, I price things so that they're accessible. So they're like accessible. everything's got a sliding scale. Like I, I grew yeah. up poor. Right. And like yeah. for me, getting into witchcraft was really hard just because of the financial barrier when I was yeah. young. I yeah. don't want anyone to face that. So mm -hmm. like you can workshops are like five bucks and a lot of things yeah. are set up to be donation basis. So come on over. Please yeah. come get your magic. You yeah. know. Go get your magic, folks. Absolutely. All right, Irene, thank you so much. This was an thank absolute pleasure. Thank you for having pleasure. me, Devin. It was so nice to get to talk to you. Yeah. I, yeah. Next time we run into each other, we'll actually have to sit down and, and break out the bottle of whiskey and, and do that it. That sounds so, good. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. I think that sounds great. All right. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And everyone, stay tuned. We'll be back next week with more magical modern witch awesomeness. Yay.